Sport Radio. Here comes the siren. I want to go higher. Oh, my goodness. Oh, baby, for sure, indeed. Cabin Sports Radio, Lecter, unbreakable Mike Gibbons with you. How you doing, Mike? I'm good, man. How you doing? Good, good. One more week in isolation for you, and then uh, and then we make our long-awaited return to a studio together. Mike, how terrifying right. is that? It's going to be weird. We're a couple months removed now from seeing each other's faces and doing a show in person. Uh, I'm hoping there's not too much rust. We'll just we'll get that out of the way real quick. But I'm I can emerge from my cave in two days time, and then of course uh, that frees me up for next Monday. I'll make my my triumphant return to Cabin Sports Radio in the actual studio, and we can do radio the way it's meant to be, and that's us looking into each other's faces while we deliver quality programming. All I can hope is that your face still looks somewhat the same. It's been a while. Yeah. I don't know. It's been I don't a know while. if you got some unruly beard business going on there now. I don't know. This 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 pandemic has it's changed people, Mike. It has. It has. I did I did get rid of the the facial hair though. It was bothering me. Uh, I, I did get some some sun this weekend though, but maybe that'll wear off by next weekend. Who knows? We got another week of this pandemic world we live in before I see you again. So uh, all could go out the window again. We'll see. But all going well. I will be there in the studio with you next Monday. All right. Look forward to that. It's going to be very exciting. Uh, Speaking of very exciting, coming up on the show today, we have what I thought was the Cabin Sports Radio debut of Billy O. He then reminded me that he's been on the show before, so it's not his debut, but it's very exciting nevertheless because they have a huge, big, massive announcement for Sport North and Kid Sport NWT, but we will save that. I already spilled the beans last week or the week before, but nevertheless, we will save that until we hear from from Billy O just a little bit later on in the show. Lots to talk about before we get to that. There is a ton going on, as there has been for the last couple months, despite the fact that there has been very little actual live sports happening. But let's get into it with our look back at the CSR headlines. Simply the best intro music in, uh, in all of sports podcasting, as far as I'm concerned. Mike, what's going on in the NHL's return to play plan? Here we go. It's going to be a big week, Lecter, for the NHL's return to play plan as teams prepare to travel to Hub Cities, Toronto, and Edmonton for the 2020 Stanley Cup playoffs. Under the approved plan, players cannot turn in a positive COVID-19 test within 48 hours of their travel date, meaning anyone who turns in a positive test on Wednesday or Thursday would be unable to travel with their team. The playoffs will officially kick off on August 1st, which is, correct me if I'm wrong, next Saturday. Next Saturday, man. Next, next Saturday. Next, next Saturday. That's right. Not this Saturday. But next Saturday. Not this Saturday. Next, next Saturday. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, well, very exciting. We are on the uh, the home stretch. Uh, seemingly, there has been nothing that was going to get into the in the NHL's way. I think we, you know, when when the original return to play um, pitch was kind of made, and we got a sense of what was potentially going to come if there was a return to play. We kind of, I think, we were kind of thinking that you know they're going to go into this as safely as possible, and if there's any sense that there is a chance that players' uh, health is potentially in danger due to COVID-19 and and a presence of it spreading throughout the teams, that that might be it. They might just shut it down there. That has not happened. There have been multiple incidents of practice facilities leading up during teams' individual training camps that have been shut down due to uh, certain players contracting COVID-19. The league has been 
trying to be kind of hush hush about that, but it's it's you know as far as individual players, it's done a decently good job of keeping the exact identity of the players who have turned in positive tests fairly quiet. But it's been pretty easy to narrow down if you really want to look into it. Uh, we've had big names like Austin Matthews come out say they tested positive for COVID-19. He's recovered now, but then there were teams, facilities uh, in the past few weeks that have been shut down. The St. Louis Blues, the Tampa Bay Lightning, just to name a few. I think the Colorado Avalanche had a similar situation. So it's not been a perfect, uh, smooth ride up until this point, but it does seem like the NHL is firmly committed. There is not a whole lot that could happen unless, you know, an entire team be deemed unfit to travel due to positive tests. They've just not let anything get in their way. So, Mike, as far as I can tell, it looks like based on everything we've seen to this point and where we are now, there's nothing that's going to stop the playoffs from kicking off on August 1st. It, it, you, no, I think you're exactly right. I don't know if you also saw some, some of the images that came out of Edmonton this past week after really, really heavy rainfall. Uh, and Rogers Arena was uh, flooded at one of the entrances. Oh, I didn't uh, see but, that. Wow. Yeah, pretty bad. Like pretty, pretty extensive water damage. It looked like in one of the, the entranceways, uh, one of the halls anyways, um, which provide access to the, uh, the facility and the arena itself. Um, but officials pretty quickly came out saying uh, we, we don't expect this at all to interfere with our plans to, to kick things off on time, and that being um, August August 1st, next uh, Saturday. So all, all things pointing in the right direction right now, teams undergoing their own uh, form of training camps. The issue really now is, is it, it's going to be an abbreviated uh, training session before we kick right into the playoffs with uh, there'll be some some seeding games between the top four teams in in each conference um, and then of course I guess you could call them the play-in matches the best of five uh, to really round out the rest of the playoff picture and and see um, which which other teams will make it into the, the final dance to round off the um, the tournament of 16 the traditional Stanley Cup uh, postseason format Um but the, the issue kind of now, in addition to this abbreviated training camp, is participation. Um, so we're seeing with a number of clubs, they, they still, and that's got to be tough on, on some of the, the coaching staff. Mm-hmm. Sort of, you know, this is when you're sort of, you've in a typical season, you know, right, right towards the, the final leg, that's when you want to be playing your absolute best hockey. Everyone should right. be in good shape by that point, unless, you know, had an injury plague season and missed a significant period of time you still need to get your legs back even for professional athletes that that timing and that rhythm it's not going to be there if there's this you know type of hiatus or, or break that we've experienced for the last couple of months so now you're you're preparing for for one team you should have one team in mind before you you move on and start considering another opponent but everyone knows who they're going to be playing uh mm-hmm. for the most part in in the first round um but you've got this abbreviated uh, training period in addition to what's the case with a number of teams not having a full lineup, whether yeah. it be travel issues or injuries or illnesses, which uh, teams are not expected to disclose. But, you know, I'm sure there are some some players that are being uh, diagnosed with, with COVID-19 right now, players that we don't know about which would be the reason why we're seeing some of these training centers and facilities closing down, um, limited um, uh, participation in in training camp or scrimmages or team drills. Um, The Boston Bruins, for instance, are are down nine regular players as their training camp is is in uh, mid-swing right now. Uh, David Pasternak, uh, as soon as the hiatus was announced by the NHL, went back overseas to uh, the Czech Republic, which in hindsight was a much safer option given how COVID-19 cases really exploded in the United States after the pandemic sort of took off. Um, but now there, you know, there's travel issues where, where people are making their way back into the States uh, before they'll have to come up to the two hub cities. Um, and we're seeing players go off with sort of un- for undisclosed reasons and mm-hmm. then being determined unfit to play afterwards. So you wonder if there's some, diagnoses uh, handed out there after the fact, or that's the reason why an explanation anyways, for, for some of this limited participation. So um, 
you know, it's going to be no matter what, it's going to be tough because you're you're trying to get back into the playoffs, which is the, the toughest time of the year, the, the most physical, most demanding hockey in, in every sense of the word. Uh, but now you're dealing with these sort of other issues, including travel, health and wellness and limited participation in, in training camp when you really want to get everyone going. So that's, that's sort of what's going on right now. But uh, hopefully by the end of the week, we'll we'll see most teams or, or all teams make their way to their hub cities and um, for their sake, um, for every team's sake, have, have full participation. Uh, you know, people nursing injuries. I mean, this hiatus would have been great. Um, oh, you know, we're both Leaf, yeah. Leaf, Leaf fans here. So, you know, they'll get uh, Mikheyev uh, back, who had that really bad wrist injury. Right, uh, yeah. I, I'm not sure where Muzzin stands right now. But, you know, for some of those those players who are, you know, maybe nursing a nagging injury or something like that, uh, I mean, that hiatus probably came at a really good time. Um, but there will be, uh, there could be other potential COVID-19 diagnoses that, that come up. And, and maybe that's why we're not seeing full participation at, at some of these uh, training camps. But hopefully uh, by the end of the week, all teams are able to make it to their hub sites and uh, we'll be all set for next week. Yeah, we're entering into a bit of a uh, strange scenario that you kind of outlined there with uh, obviously a lot of people saw headlines that the Boston Bruins, as you mentioned, have apparently nine players that have been deemed unfit to play. Now, that unfit to play has never really been a terminology that the NHL has used before. Now, there's been times when players have maybe come into, uh, you know, come into training camp out of shape and they, you know, haven't passed a physical or something like that. But it's never been it's never been framed that way. They didn't pass the physical, so they are unfit to play. They would just straight out say they didn't pass their physical and everyone would point at them and say, shame, shame. You're yeah. out of shape. Uh, <laughs> you're not prepared for the season. But now Dustin, we're... get in shape. That's right. Yeah, less pancakes, more skating. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but now you're seeing this unfit to play terminology, which is kind of now just in our in our minds being translated as, oh, they may be showing some symptoms of COVID nineteen. Right. I mean, we've laughed and made jokes for years about the NHL's kind of. Uh, vagueness when it comes to report, reporting and disclosing injuries. There's, you know, for years right. there's been the running joke of the lower body injury or the upper body mm-hmm. injury, um, to which we thought, well, I mean, I, I guess COVID-19 would be an upper body injury. It's more of a respiratory thing than yeah, anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they haven't, you know, obviously this is, a, this is a bit of uncharted territory. Like if a player in the past just had the flu, they would probably have just said, they're sick or even just specified and said they have the flu. Yeah. They'll be, they'll be out for day to day. Mm -hmm. This is obviously a a, a bit bigger than just the regular flu. And there's as, as has been, as has been outlined, you know, somewhat kind of privacy issues because there is, there's still a a bit of a stigma attached to, uh, to COVID-19, especially, you know, four or five months into uh, the pandemic here and there's there's now definitely a, a stigma that if you have contracted COVID-19, that it means that you've done something wrong or you've been careless or something mm-hmm. along those lines. So I think the NHL has been very aware of that and they're trying to keep that as under wraps as possible while still, you know, understanding that the nature of hockey is that you're going to have injuries, whether it's just muscle strains because players are a bit out of shape and are coming back into training camps or, you know, actual uh, physical injuries, whatever it is, you've now you now have to kind of factor that all into the fact that, well, if you have certain players that you're saying, oh, he, uh, you know, he uh, he dislocated his shoulder or something, he's going to be out for a bit. You can't even you can't even really specify that much anymore because if you have certain players where you're saying you're actually saying upper or lower body injury, you know, because they have whatever pulled a groin or, or dislocated something. And then you have other players who have, who are just not on the ice and you're just labeling them as unfit to play. It's like, well, that that's kind of a dead giveaway as to what's going on here. So I think in effect, the NHL has maybe learned that, you know what, we kind of have to just, blanket term every kind of injury or or reason for a player not being on the ice as being deemed unfit to play and it's kind of i think it's it's blown up a little bit now there's a not not really a pr nightmare yet but when someone like Sidney crosby 
leaves practice 20 minutes early, which he did over the weekend, and is yep. now deemed unfit to play, well, our imaginations start to uh, run a little bit wild, don't they? Yeah, and, and that's the thing. Uh, immediately, I think people's minds are sort of going to go there. Um, if, if you've got players, star players, coming off the ice, leaving practice early, and then later being deemed unfit to play. Same with uh, Pasternak after he came back from uh, from Europe. I think he participated in a couple uh, skating sessions and then likewise was deemed, quote-unquote, unfit to play um, by uh, by Boston Bruins staff. And then I don't know if he's been back on the ice since. But you're right, you know, immediately your mind sort of goes there. Uh, oh, they're deemed unfit to play. You kind of just... That's that's where your mind goes. Have yeah. they contracted COVID nineteen? Are, are other players in the organization now potentially at risk of also contracting uh, COVID nineteen? And and that's that's you know we're living in interesting times right now. For instance, you know in in day to day life, even in in our professions, if we have a coworker say, "Oh, I'm, I don't really feel like coming in today. I, I got a bit of a cold." Well, immediately now it's like, whoa. Yeah. But take what, take off take off a couple more days yeah. after that and maybe and then some right yeah and um, and maybe so, then self monitor for a week or so and that's yeah. right yeah. yeah so you're right maybe that's that's why this sort of blanket approach has come out and uh you know right when we're trying you know they did their due diligence by by picking hub cities in uh the states there there should be no travel uh they'll be in their bubbles much like what the NBA has done while Florida is sort of certainly not a, a good example of how to contain the <laughs> pandemic at this point. Um, they, they, it appears that the NBA has a pretty safe bubble and there won't be much travel inside and outside of that, if any at all. Um, so no, the league, the NHL has, has done its due diligence to secure these hub cities. And of course they're going to have health and safety at the forefront. Um, so, so this would be a, you know, a bit of a blowback if, if they, if there were players and especially star players contracting COVID. So uh, my guess is that's probably why they went in the direction of this more blanket approach. Uh, they're deemed unfit to play for all we know, maybe they're just really out of shape, uh, which, which could be the case for a lot of players. It was a pretty long hiatus and everyone dealt with uh, the pandemic differently. So, you know, maybe some, some habits were healthier than others. And, and suddenly now they're getting back on the ice and, and guys are realizing they're not nearly as in shape as they, as they should be. So let's, let's hope there are no more, uh, you know, COVID-19 diagnoses. And uh, cause that would be a really big blowback for, for the NHL. Uh, and they've, they've worked really hard to award a Stanley cup winner for 2020. Only two seasons previously have, has there not been one awarded? We went over those last week. So, um, you know, hopefully, everyone's able to make it to their their hub cities and uh, uh we should be enjoying some playoff hockey in less than two weeks well that's the complicating thing to this whole scenario is that yeah like in the case of the boston bruins we know they're not exactly a young lineup so no, there no. is a very good chance that nine boston bruins have come in and are in you know various states of uh, of repair and uh, right. and, and conditioning so there's actually a decent chance that you know, seven, eight, maybe all nine of those players are like a little bit out of shape and maybe pulled a groin yeah. muscle or something, you know? So like, there's a chance that that's true. <laughs> there's also a chance that nine Boston Bruins have contracted COVID-19. We just, we don't yeah. know. There's so much, there's so much gray area when now there is just this blanket term that unfortunately is, you know, is, uh, as confusing and, uh, and, and, yeah. Yeah, whatever it, as as it is, that they kind of have to go with that blanket term because yeah, you don't want to you don't want to out anyone as much as possible. You want to keep right. you know, uh, and and you don't you don't want to throw gas onto the fire, right? It's already no. raging out of control, and you you certainly want to keep things as as quiet as possible. You know, yeah. you, you want to make news for the right reasons, that being hopefully a great playoff that is fun to watch and, and all that. You don't want to make noise for, uh, yeah, for potential safety reasons and potentially complicating what has already been a uh, very crazy time and pandemic that we are experiencing. So like you say, hopefully this is uh, just kind of something, a bit of a, growing pain for lack of a better term that the NHL yep. has to endure and uh, and we all come out okay and their return to play plan goes as smoothly as could be uh in the meantime 
While we wait for that August 1st return to play date, uh, there were some uh, major award finalists announced for the NHL awards this year. That's another thing that has been delayed because of the pandemic. But uh, they announced who the finalists are for the Norris Trophy, the Calder Trophy, the Vezina, Jack Adams, Ted Lindsay Award, and the Selkie Heart uh, MVP award to be announced tomorrow with the finalists for that one. Uh, Mike, what do you think of the candidates so far? So for the Norris, we've got uh, John Carlson, Victor Hedman, Roman mm-hmm. Yossi for top defenseman for uh, for the Calder Award. We've got Quinn Hughes and Kale McCarr. I, I think like normally there's there's three or so finalists, but I don't think there's any question that it's going to be one of those two. Yep. Uh, the Vezina goaltender of the year, you got Connor Hellebuck, uh, Tuka Rask, and uh, Vasilevsky from the Tampa Bay Lightning. Jack Adams, Coach of the Year, Bruce Cassidy, John Tortorella, and Elaine Vigneault. Uh, Ted Lindsay Award, uh, the MVP as voted by the players. Leon Dreisaitl, Nathan McKinnon, and Artemi Panarin. And the Selkie, uh, Patrice Bergeron, Sean Couturier, and Ryan O'Reilly. What do you th- who's, your, uh, who's your go-to pick for the Norris Trophy? For the Norris Trophy, and I think even at the start of this year, you you would have had these three names probably at the top. Uh, you know, there have been some other, um, you know, perennial picks, if you will, like the uh, the Carlsons uh, who dealt with uh, uh, Eric Carlson. That is not uh, not John Carlson right. at the Capitals. Yes. Um, but yeah, he had a, had a number of health issues, came kind of slow out of the gate. So Carlson leading all defensemen in in scoring. Um, uh, with 75 points, I believe, by the time the, the season was was called off, um, not too far off was uh, was Yossi. So um, and and had been right in the mix of it too. Uh, so uh, leading towards Carlson, that would be my pick um, uh, of the Washington Capitals. Another really good campaign for uh, the American. Uh, defenseman, so uh, I'd imagine he'd probably be the the front runner at this point. Yeah, I would have to agree with you there. Uh, John Carlson just having a fantastic season, and just he just gets better and better every year. Like it doesn't seem like he has changed his style of play at all, but he's just such a smooth customer, and just seems to become a more efficient player uh, each and every year. So yeah, I, I think John Carlson. I agree with you there. He's got to be the uh, the Norris Trophy winner this year. Calder, I think you, it's kind of a toss-up. I mean, Kale yeah. McCarr had a huge start to the season. Don't I think he he had a bit of a injury trouble uh, yeah. at some point mid-season. And Quinn Hughes, I think, just kind of I don't think anyone expected anything of Quinn Hughes, but man, does he burst onto the scene for the Vancouver Canucks? What an exciting player uh, he has become, and giving them you know, even more hope for the future. You add him to an already young and exciting and fast roster. Yeah. yeah the Canucks have, uh, have a lot to look forward to in the future there, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that one's, that one's pretty much a toss up. You can't lose, but the exciting thing about that, when was the last time you had two defensemen, two defensemen in yeah. the finalists for the rookie of the year award? I think I, I- I think in pretty much every other category, you can sort of lean on on a, on a favorite. This one, to me, I think is going to be the most razor thin yeah. of margins. But you, you hit it on the head. Exciting that they're both two really young blue liners on two really surprising teams. Yes. Uh, Vancouver had uh, by by any standard had a great year, um, and it's not over yet. But yeah, when you throw in uh, Pedersen, uh, Horvat, Besser. Hughes now there's a lot of reason for optimism there on uh, on the west coast absolutely uh, same story with with kale mccarr uh and i will probably get to it in a little bit with the uh mckinnon uh being likely a candidate for the Hart trophy which we'll find out tomorrow um but uh one of the three finalists uh for the ted Lindsay award mvp as voted by the players i think by the time of the season's uh suspension um mckinnon was was leading the abs in scoring uh, with 93 points, and there was a huge margin uh, between the second closest scorer, who was in fact Kale McCarr as a as a, def- uh, a rookie defenseman on a on a really fun up and coming surprising team in the West in in the Colorado Avalanche. So good story all around. I think this will be the the tightest of margins uh, because I, I do believe in pretty much every other category you've got uh, you've got a front runner, uh, but th- that this will be the one to watch I think, and, and obviously both deserving. Yeah, Vezina Trophy goaltender of the year. I don't I don't know if I'm if I'm on the same page as you for the front runner who it should be, but a little biased here, but you got Connor Halibuck, uh mm-hmm. Tuka Rask and uh, Andre Vasilevsky. 
to me, it, it's got to be Connor Hellebuck. Yes. Tuka Rask, you know, he continues to have a fantastic career. and But I don't want to take anything away from what a goaltender he is, but continuing to benefit from playing behind one of the most stellar uh, defensively minded teams in, in the modern day NHL. The Boston Bruins are defensive uh, stalwarts. They've been the best defensive team in the year uh, or in the league for God, like the last decade at least. And Tuka Rask mm-hmm. has been a huge benefactor of that. He's been a huge contributor to that as well. Don't get me wrong, but definitely a huge benefactor of that. Vasilevsky, I think, you know, not exactly uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning more offensive powered, but you're still playing behind a fantastic and uh, and veteran defense core. I think he's a benefactor of that as well. Meanwhile, you look at Connor Hellebuck. Not only did he have a bounce back year with the Winnipeg Jets this year, but he came into a season where the Winnipeg Jets had lost six of their starting seven defensemen from yep. last year. And he turned in the kind of numbers he did, and they needed him to be. He he was every bit as good as the Jets needed him to be to be in a playoff position, which they were when the season went on hiatus. I think without question, you got to give Connor Hellebuck the Vesna Trophy this year. It, it feels like a lifetime ago, but I remember talking about uh, you know sort of what the playoff picture was shaping up to be before the suspension of the season. And it, it would have been in one of our shows in the in the late fall, early winter last year, where we said, basically, if you wipe out the month of, because the Jets got off to a really slow start yes. last year. If you wipe out the month of October and, and maybe the first half of November or something like that, they are right thick in the playoff picture, probably competing for uh, a top position in, in the central division. But of course we know that the NHL season is 82 games long and, and you need well, to be not good throughout. Year. Well, not, no, not this year. That's <laughs> right. That's right. We lost a couple yeah. as a result of the suspension, but yeah, you have to take into account the team that's in front of, um, of all these goaltenders. Rask also a smaller sample size because really between him and Yaroslav Halak, they were pretty much sharing the crease for uh, the entire season leading up to the suspension um and, and Vasilevsky you know you don't want to say someone is a is a system is a system goalie but he's obviously benefiting from a much stronger blue line um than Connor Hellbuck would have in Winnipeg yeah. a, a blue line that was dealt a major blow heading into the season and, and I know we talked about that a lot in the in the fall but some very prominent departures uh I, a lot of people might have been writing off the Jets but he bounced back and then some after a pretty shaky start to the season um, and he's a huge reason why the Jets are, are in the playoff picture uh, right now. So he he was also my my front runner for this award. Jack Adams, Coach of the Year, Bruce Cassidy, uh, John Tortorella, Alain Vigneault. Man, you know, we, we all like to have fun with torts and uh, make our jokes, but his name just keeps reappearing in the finalists yep. for Coach of the Year year after year. And, I mean, it's hard to argue. The guy gets results. And I, you know, short of, short of Bruce Cassidy, because, I mean, he... He really led the Boston Bruins to a just a, a, a wonderful season. They, uh, mm-hmm. it's it's really impressive the body of work that they put together this year, and just looked as as though if the pandemic hadn't happened, that they would just be cruising into the playoffs and probably would have gone at least a few rounds. They just looked like such a solid unit. So. I don't know. I think between not to you know completely uh, ignore Alain Vigno, but. I think it's got to between, but got to be between Cassidy and Tortorella. Yep, um, obviously the Bruins, the the best season of any team in the NHL, a hundred points by the the time of the suspension. Uh, Vigneault, uh, that feels like a, a pretty good feel good story for me. That I don't think anyone expected the Flyers to be in the position they were at the time that the season was suspended in, in mid March, uh, and they'll be one of the top four teams in the in the Eastern Conference vying for. Uh, that that first overall seed uh, when they they play some play in games, um, the Bruins, Lightning, Capitals, and Flyers being the the top four teams in the Eastern Conference. So they, they're the you know their their season was a surprise to me. So it's nice to see that Vigneault's, uh getting that recognition. When you're talking about Torts, uh, you know they they had a rough off season, right? Uh, mm-hmm. After after swinging for the fences in uh, a trade deadline last year, um, they they saw Artemi Panarin walk. Um, yeah, uh, they saw 
Uh, Sergey Bob Bobrovsky. Bobrovsky, yeah. Walk, yeah. yeah, they lost to Shane. Yeah. Uh, so it was a rough off season and end of season. Uh, uh, and, and they su- obviously surprised the NHL world uh, last year with a first round sweep of the uh, President's Trophy winning uh, Tampa Bay Lightning. Uh, and, and that has much to do with uh, with uh, Torts being at the helm. And uh, could very well eliminate the Maple Leafs in the first round, uh, best of five <laughs> series to advance to play one of the teams, uh, one of the top teams in the East uh, when the, the playoff picture is complete. Uh, so I, I don't really know what way I'm leaning. If I, if I had to completely guess, uh, for me it's between Vigneault and, and Cassidy because, I mean, you can't, you can't overlook the the season that uh, the Bruins put together. They had a fantastic regular season, uh, but if we're going feel good story, I, I guess Vigneault because uh, I, I certainly did not have the Philadelphia Flyers in uh, really one point behind uh, Washington uh, when the season was suspended for first in the division. I just, I certainly didn't have them that high. Yeah, uh, fair so enough. Three three very worthy candidates. Um, for me, it's between Cassidy and Vigneault, and and I couldn't even I couldn't even land in one direction. Maybe no love for the Western Conference, by the way, but <laughs> uh, don't know why that is. But uh, I mean, maybe I'll just go with the best regular season team, and and let's say it's Bruce Cassidy. Okay, fair enough. I mean, uh, yeah, like you, you you make a very good point about the Philadelphia Flyers. Like for me, it 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 always felt like they were a, a roster that had the talent and the depth but yeah perhaps that was all it was missing was the direction you get a mm-hmm. veteran coach like Alan Vigneault who's had who's had success like really yep. everywhere he's gone and uh and maybe that was just the missing piece so uh yeah very good argument there uh yeah with Tortorella I mean you would have you would have easily been able to forgive the Columbus Blue Jackets from just having got awful season but no no, they just found a way to get it done. Uh, I'm leaning on torts. I don't know. We're, we're yeah, divided okay. on I this like one. It. Yeah, why not? Uh, Ted Lindsay Award, which is the MVP award as voted by the players, Leon Dreisaitl, Nathan McKinnon, and Artemi Panarin. It's a little strange to not see Connor McDavid's name in there. Instead, you got Leon Dreisaitl, but Dreisaitl was leading, I, I think, the league in points, was he not? Let yeah. alone the Edmonton Oilers. So definitely deserves to be there. And... You know, I, I got to give him a little extra love, too, because there was definitely a couple times when I happened to catch an Oilers game. And every time I watched, I was just like, man, you know what? I don't give this guy enough credit for how good no. he is. It If he wasn't on the same team as a guy named Connor McDavid, you would probably hear a lot more about him, which is saying quite a bit because you hear a lot about him as it is. I think I think you could very easily make the case that they have the two best players in all of hockey. Yeah, um, and you're right. It's it's sort of a, a detriment to him that he's playing alongside probably the consensus number one player in the world in in Connor McDavid just because of his his sheer speed and uh, he the, the way that he's able to play the game at 100 miles an hour. It's it's something I don't think we've ever seen before. Um, but if you're talking about consistency over a span, like he might be the the highest scoring player in the entire national hockey league over the last three seasons. I'm yeah. not quite sure, but, but there's close could very yeah. well make a case. He is right there and doesn't, doesn't get the due credit that's deserved 110 points when the season was suspended 13 above his teammate, Connor uh, McDavid uh, in second place in the, uh, the NHL scoring race. Um, for me, it's, it's, it's him. Uh, and be, just because uh, McDavid did miss some time with injury as well, that's why he's a little bit further below in the, uh, in the, uh, the scoring race, but uh, obviously uh, the Art Ross winner as the league's overall point leader, um, and and I do think this is the year that he walks away with with probably the Ted Lindsay Award and the Hart Trophy as well. I think the one case you can make for McKinnon, and I sort of alluded to it earlier, uh, a lot of uh, time missed from both uh, Gabriel Landeskog and his line mate uh, Miko Rantanen, mm. uh, both missing significant chunks of the season, and he was unquestionable questionably their guy uh 93 points when the season was suspended the next closest score was 50 so a whole 43 points behind and that was their rookie defenseman and uh, calder finalist uh, kale mccarr so he is the the heart and soul of that team and really combines you know when you think of um you know mcdavid and um and the, you know the austin matthews type players of the league he's that he's he can tie all of their strengths really into one. He can score at an elite level. He's extremely fast, can turn on a dime, 
and has one of the best releases in the entire National Hockey League. Uh, so if there is a case to be made for him, to, it's between those two for me. Panarin obviously had a great year for the Rangers. They got a nice one-two punch with him and uh, Zavanna Jad, and it was a gr- the Rangers had a great year, and, and certainly I would consider them one of the, the dark horse candidates to, to go on a pretty good run here when uh, when the playoffs resume. Yeah. Uh, so it's between Dry Settle and McKinnon for me, but I, I have to give the edge to Dry Settle. He 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 had a great season, and uh, there were there was time when when McDavid was off the ice, and he he willed his team to victory, and and just the level of consistency over the last few years, he really he really should get a lot more credit than he does. He is easily one of the premier talents in the league. Yeah, hard to disagree with any of that. And like you say, we didn't say much about Artemi Panarin, but putting putting together a pretty fantastic season oh, himself, yeah. uh, finished with 95 points in 69 games, you know, proving that he was worth every dollar of that massive contract he signed with the New York Absolutely. Rangers. Uh, but, yeah, I, I don't know how you argue with Leon Dreisaitl, man. Like, that's... Uh, there, there, there is no argument there. When, when you're... No. When when you're up against Connor McDavid and you're still coming out ahead and establishing yourself as arguably the best player in the world yep. in comparison to that guy, that like that's something special. Yeah, I think you got to go with Leon Dreisaitl. And uh, finally, the Selkie, best defensive forward, Patrice Bergeron, perennial winner, Sean Couturier, <laughs> and uh, Ryan O'Reilly. They're all guys who are always in the conversation. I don't really know how you make uh, a decipherable difference between any of them. All had fantastic seasons. Like you said, uh, the Philadelphia Flyers really surprising the entire league with the season they put together. And of course, Sean Couturier Couturier being a huge part of that. But I mean, how do you look past Patrice Bergeron, right? Right. And I know a lot of it is, is name recognition, but that top line, the perfection line with him past a, and Marchand is the best line in hockey in terms of what they give you. You know, when it comes power play time, it's it's lights out. They're gonna they're gonna score. Uh, if you give them chances, they will score. But they're just as effective at shutting down other teams' top lines, and that's what makes them so incredibly good. Yeah. And he is a peren- like you said, a perennial Selkie uh, candidate. He's always in the mix, and that's because one, he's probably the best in the business at face-offs and especially when it matters the most that's the guy you want taking draws Mm -hmm. um, especially a big defensive draw but also someone who can win you one on the offensive end when you're on a power play too yeah um so and he you know just a guy that will absolutely put his heart and soul on the line uh we've seen the sacrifices he's made in the over the years whether it's playing through really significant injuries to give his team a chance he's just that important to the Boston Bruins, and obviously a huge reason for their success. And then you've got O'Reilly too, right? The reigning uh, Con Smythe Award winner, fresh off a of Stanley Cup with the St. Louis Blues, yep. another heart and soul guy uh, who, who can give it to you on both ends of the ice. So, uh, you know, for name recognition's sake, you, you kind of want to give it to someone like Bergeron because he really he just gets more more of a profile just because he was playing on the best line in all of hockey. Um, but obviously, Couturier had a great year with uh, the Philadelphia Flyers, a big reason for their success, and then being right at the top of the Metro. Uh, and then O'Reilly, like the, the blue, you know, out of the West, it, you know, the Blues and the Central Division full uh, avalanche probably have as good a chance as anyone in, in representing the West in the Stanley Cup Finals. Um, and uh, fresh off a deep playoff run, Ryan O'Reilly is a huge reason for that too. So three really good candidates, Um I don't even know what way I'm leaning, but if I were, I'll go the name recognition route and I'll go with Patrice Bergeron. Yeah, you can't go wrong with any of the three. And the really scary thing about Patrice Bergeron is he seems to be getting better with age, which is for a Leafs fan absolutely terrifying all right we are going to take a break and uh, we'll be back uh, with billy o and dakota earl big news from sport north that's next on cabin sports radio cabin sports radio cabin sports radio brought to you by sport north moving sport forward joining us on the show now a friend of the show and uh from the sponsors of the show sport north it is the manager of sport programs, Bill Othmer. How you doing, Billy? Great, Scott. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on the show. And, uh, of course, joining you today is Dakota Earl of Sport North. How are you doing today, Dakota? 
I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So we are here because there is very exciting news coming out of Sport North. The annual Peterson and OJ Kid Sport Golf Tournament did not go ahead as usually planned. Usually it ha- happens like early July, sometime around there. Obviously, we've had a few complications in the past few months, in case you weren't aware. But very excited to announce that it is happening once again. The Peterson and OJ 68th Annual Kid Sport Golf Tournament returning to the Yellowknife Golf Club August 28th. Very excited for this. Billy, how did you guys make it happen? Well, we're, we're excited as well. And, and, and like I said, it, it did take a lot of of uh, planning and uh, and coordinating with uh, our good friend Cole Marshall at the, uh, the Yellowknife Golf Course, who helped us out a lot with respect to to logistics. We're still, uh, you know, we're, it's, we're still early in the uh, in in the the, the stage of uh, of having the the event. So we usually do have it in July. So we're hoping that uh, there'll be a few more of the the COVID measures uh, released a little bit. So we have uh, we can have a lot more people at the event. Awesome. It's uh, awesome that you guys were able to make this happen. Obviously, like we said, uh, a lot of complications in the last few months. A lot of big events, annual events that people look forward to all year long have had to be canceled throughout the summer. So the fact that you guys were able to find a way to make this happen and uh, continue what is an amazing tradition. It's the 68th, again, Peterson and OJ annual Kid Sport Golf Tournament uh, raises a lot of very important funds for Kid Sport NWT. Uh, so it's awesome that you guys were able to make this happen. Dakota, you are uh, coordinating the golf tournament this year. Obviously, there are going to be some changes from previous years. What can attendees to the 68th tournament expect to see as far as uh, just differences from previous years? Uh, one of the big ones is there won't be a shotgun start. It'll be tee times. And depending on how many teams we get, we're going to space it out so that it's good for people to be on the course and then get off as soon as they're done. And at the end of the 18th hole, we're going to have a barbecue. And then after that, we will guide people to the clubhouse where we'll have a silent option set up. Another big thing will be with golf carts. There's not, there's only one person allowed per golf cart unless you live in the same household. Oh my God, that is going to cause riots. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're we're hoping to to come up with some with some creative ways to either auction them off or ensure that at, at least one of the foursomes have have a golf cart for sure. Yeah, and I mean, we I, I think most people understand that the program has changed and uh, would be would be shocked to hear otherwise with regards to golf carts. You know, they're obviously very small. There is not much ability for physical distancing unless you you know do what it usually degenerates to, which is someone driving and someone clinging onto the back. But I don't think we want to. I don't think we want to encourage that too much. Uh, Dakota, you mentioned you mentioned the banquet. That's uh, obviously a big part of it. People look forward to that every year. Uh, you're doing a barbecue instead this year. Is that right? Yes. At the end of the 18th hole, once everyone's down, there'll be some burgers and stuff, and then we will. People can linger for a little bit, then we're going to guide them to the clubhouse to do their silent auction and walk through, and then they can leave. Okay, and for the silent auction, that's obviously a big part of it, too. Kind of the uh, the, the big finale at the end of the night when people really get to dig deep and uh, raise some some great money for Kid Sport NWT, uh, and usually bidding on some amazing prizes that have been donated by uh, by local sponsors as well. Uh, how, what, what is the format for this? Is it going to be, uh, just, you know, just going through the line and putting in, uh, bids for, for auction prizes? Um, we were thinking of just having a box and then people write down and then whoever wrote down the highest bid would get the auction item. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's our line of thinking. We, we, we understand that there's at, at the banquet there's always at the end the the live auction right uh, and obviously we can't get everyone together so we're coming up with some creative ways uh, I'd like to thank Divic uh, for for provide sponsoring another diamond this time around so uh, one of our line of thinkings is to ensure that uh, it's only the people that are at the at the event uh, have access to to winning that diamond whether it's by Buying a square like you do at a football pool, or um, or buying tickets, 
Um, but we really want to make sure that our golfer experience isn't hindered by not being able to to, to sit down and have a, a good sit down banquet. We really want to make sure that that the businesses as well are uh, are supported in this, and we and we we understand that you know there are some trying times for for some local businesses here. So uh, Dakota has been doing a fantastic job in in getting in touch. And we are very, we're very pleasantly surprised that we have had a, a few already come back and say, yes, we'll donate this, that, and the other thing. So thank you very much out there. Awesome. That is so good to hear. Um, and also, I, I think may, may be a relief that the live auction has taken a year off. I know our, uh, our, our news director here, Ollie Williams, has frequently <laughs> been the auctioneer at the live auction, which can often get chaotic and i think there was a couple of years where the sound system wasn't working so well and he just had to yell the whole time his voice yeah. was uh you know i don't know i still don't know that it's quite recovered from uh, a few of those live auctions of uh <laughs> sport north and kid sport past but great to hear that you guys have figured it out and uh it sounds like it's going to be an amazing time uh billy so obviously like we're saying we talk mostly about changes that are necessary with regards to uh COVID-19 and the restrictions that have been put in place to keep people as safe as possible. Um, Mm -hmm. Can you obviously like think, take us back to about mid March when I think was when the pandemic really hit here and suddenly kind of became real. The Arctic winter games, which were supposed to take place in Whitehorse this past, uh, this past winter were one of, if I can recall correctly, I think it was like the first big event that was canceled due to the COVID-19 pandemic. You guys are obviously, as far as the Northwest Territories goes, you are the main people involved with regards to the Arctic Winter Games, the Canada Summer Games, Canada Winter Games, all of these multi-sport events, Sport North has a major hand in. Take us back to that time, how you were feeling when you, when it was becoming real that this might not happen and then the fallout after. How were you feeling around that time? Well, you just kind of give me a flashback, and I don't want to compare it to when Elvis died, but uh, <laughs> I really remember where I was when I got the, the text from our chef de mission, Doug Rentmeister. I was actually renegotiating our, our mortgage, and I got a text, and I looked down, and he, he said, Arctic Winter Games canceled. Oh. And then I don't know how, what happened, but I with my mortgage, but I don't, don't think I did a very good job in the negotiations. <laughs> so, but yeah, it was a real, it was a real disappointment. And to be honest with you, um, we, I believed initially, wow, like they're, they're doing this too early. What's going on? Right. Uh, because I'm not informed. I wasn't informed. I'm obviously not on the, on the ground. And uh, boy, the, that whole society really looked like they, they, they knew what they were doing and they, they, they made the right decision. Now I understand that it was very disappointing to a lot of our of our athletes and our teams, especially those who uh, don't have a chance again to to participate. So um, I'm, I'm not on the the ins, ins and outs of what's happening in the next games yet, but uh, we're hoping that uh, there's there could be some opportunities to either I don't know about extending the age or or we obviously wouldn't be able to make a new category because of of the amount of uh, participants the anticipated participants are pretty well fixed I'm, a number of them, so yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I'm glad you mentioned that uh, you know your very honest feelings in, in your initial reaction to when it was canceled feeling like oh they're jumping the gun because I I think you're you're right there along with the rest of us who you know whether or not we got with the program later on, that was the the initial reaction. I remember I was sitting, I was ha- celebrating a friend's birthday at the Woodyard. And when I saw <laughs> the news break that the Arctic Winter Games had been canceled, and I just, you know, that was my reaction too. It was like, oh my God, like what is next? Are they really going to cancel everything? We then, it, you know, slowly it, realized that, yeah, and it's for a pretty good reason too. But I, I feel like that is important to remember that, it wasn't just, you know, we weren't just with the program right away. There was there was a, a an evolution of what was going on here. And uh, and that's that's especially what made it tough at the time, because a lot of us just didn't understand how how big this was. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it was 
when I got it initially, I was just going to text you and Ollie and say, is this true? Because you're usually the first to know everything around here. Right. But uh, it was uh, it was really uh, again, it was it was disappointing. You, it, it, and then you kind of went into different waves throughout the the be, even before the games. You know, when one day you'd have a good day, then the next day it'd be wow. And I can only think of the, all the hard work that the host society and their and their volunteers did to to prepare for the games. Yeah, and to have all that just bleh. You know, yeah. you have the the Canada Plus Fifty Five games. We're trying to get them back into Kamloops in the next one or two years. We also have the um, well, obviously the Olympics. They they went. They're going uh, the year after. But that was it for Whitehorse. The you know that was the that was their time to shine. And and I really really felt for the their staff and their volunteers. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, you're continuing to uh, to navigate. You know, the the new reality, quote unquote, as we're we're kind of uh, approaching it now. Things change, changing still kind of on a daily basis. Uh, but great to hear uh, that we are seeing these, you know, these these sparks of positivity. And one of which being certainly that the announcement that the uh, the Peterson and OJ 68th annual Kids Sport Golf Tournament is going ahead. August 28th, Yellowknife Golf Club. Billy, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Dakota, thank you so much for joining us as well. Wish you all the best in this year's tournament. Thanks very much, Scott. And we just like to thank Chair Roger Walker for support his support and his leadership in, in this. He's, uh, he's doing a great job. Absolutely. Awesome. We will take a break and be back on Cabin Sports Radio. Cabin Sports Radio. Cabin Sports Radio brought to you by Sport North. Moving sport forward. Huge news with the return of the Peterson and OJ Kids Sport NWT Golf Tournament. I'd like to thank Billy O and Dakota Earl for joining us on the show. Very much looking forward to that. And if you want more information or you're looking to register a team, by all means, go to sportnorth.com. It is for a worthy cause and it's going to be a wonderful day at the Yellowknife Golf Club. All right, Mike. So we talked talked about the NHL, everything going into the return to play, which is still set to go for August 1st. Another league that is working, well, there's several leagues working on their return to play. The NBA uh, picking up their season and playoff imminently. The CFL is also kind of in the midst of trying to figure something out. Some might say they are floundering. Others might say they're doing what they can they have tabled a six game regular season uh players reacted in various ways most saying they're not impressed by what was tabled by the league so we'll see what happens there uh some other news that came out of the cfl that's uh Not so positive news. Last year's most outstanding player, Brandon Banks, receiver for the Hamilton Tiger Cats, uh, went public saying that he's probably not going to put a helmet on until 2021. So that's obviously a, a big blow to the league when one of your major name players is saying that you know what, I'm probably going to take it off and see what happens from there. So as far as the actual return to play goes for the CFL, it's still pretty up in the air, which is sad and scary from CFL fans' perspectives. But obviously, the big story that has come out of the world of sports, it started with the ripple effects from the Washington Redskins announcing that they were officially finally changing their name. The Edmonton Eskimos have announced about the same, that they are going to draw... Actually, they haven't even announced it. It's reports coming from the club that they have dropped the Eskimos' name and will be looking for a new franchise name within uh, the next few weeks. That's right, Lecter. Uh, Edmonton CFL franchise has yet to break its silence amid reports the club will drop its Eskimos' name. TSN and Post Media both reported the team will make the change following Washington's decision to drop its Redskins name in the NFL last week. Pressure has mounted in recent weeks for sports teams to eliminate racist or stereotypical names, and critics say the Edmonton team's name is a derogatory colonial-era term for Inuits. So, yeah, TSN, I believe it was Ryan Rashog uh, tweeted, I saw it on my timeline over the weekend, and I'll give you credit, uh, Lecter, your, your finger is usually on the pulse for this this type of thing. We were talking, obviously, about the Washington 
uh, Redskins in the NFL last week. Uh, that announcement, of course, came out uh, last weekend uh, that uh, they had decided that they will be pursuing a new name. And we sort of shifted our gaze a little bit to, to some other uh, teams around various uh, sports leagues with problematic names themselves. And the one that we sort of honed in on uh, just being so much closer to home than a lot of the other ones mm-hmm. is the CFL franchise based in Edmonton and their current name of the Eskimos. Uh, so the reports out now that uh, the team has decided that it, it will change its name. We haven't heard anything official from the club yet, but it certainly sounds like we're heading in that direction. Yeah, it sounds like there's pretty much no question at this point that there will be a team uh, name change. Not really much information beyond that. Like you said, the club has yet to actually announce it themselves. But I mean, this is this is nothing new. The The team's name has been uh, admired in controversy for at least the last five years that you've really heard strong voices outside of the league itself raising the point saying, hey, you know, maybe it's time to uh, take a second look at this. Uh, you know, probably not quite as long as the uh, as the Redskins name has been mired in controversy, but for not that much shorter There has been calls uh, to readdress the Edmonton Eskimos franchise moniker. And like we talked about last week, I mean, it's not the worst situation because you don't even really have to change the team crest. The team mascot is a polar bear, so you don't have to change that. You just have to come up with a new team name that starts with the letter E and you're good to go. Other than that, you don't have to change a whole lot. But I think uh, I think most people agree that, you know, it's time. Because as we talked about last week, if there's one person who finds a name controversial, and not for silly reasons, not because, you know, you just whatever, have something that you don't like about it. Like, I don't like war, therefore the name Blue Bombers is offensive to me. No, this is a, this is a, uh, this is a stereotype of uh, a race of people and it has been you know whether or not it's been viewed in a positive way that's at least been the argument for not changing the name that the the right. that the name was was derived from a you know a thought of love strength and resilience of of the northern people thus hey why not name it after a football team why not call them the eskimos they're the toughest people out there uh whether or not that was the case it is still a tokenizing name and that's yep. what makes it problematic and uh and i and i salute the edmonton eskimos franchise for taking this seriously and i mean not to say that they didn't before because there was last year or the year before they did hold talks with uh several northern arctic and remote communities they went out to these yeah. communities and had conversations with uh with inuit leaders about the name and and their thoughts on it I don't know that the end result was ideal because they kind of just basically said, hey, there's no 100% consensus either way. Therefore, we're going to keep the name. The Obviously, the thought about it has shifted since then, and uh, and they've come to the conclusion that, you know what, if, if we don't address this now, it's just going to keep coming up time and time again. So may as well, you know, rip the Band-Aid off, so to speak, uh, for those who it hurts to see that name leave. You know what? you'll get over it and we will move forward <laughs> and it's just a team nickname and shouldn't make anyone feel uh tokenized or marginalized or less than so all in all positive move i think without a doubt yeah and then that's that's the main issue here uh the name of a sports franchise should not be controversial and yeah. should not be tokenizing and should not single out uh, a single group of people, uh, and if the, that group of people is offended by it, well, then uh, lend an ear, hear them out. Their their concerns are probably pretty valid. Uh, so so good on the the Edmonton CFL franchise. I'm sure we'll get an official announcement sometime this week. And now we turn our gaze to uh, you know potentially the Chiefs uh, of the NFL, and then we've got the Indians uh, and the Braves of the uh, MLB and then even potentially the Blackhawks of, uh, of the NHL. I don't, I don't know how much uh, movement has, has happened. Uh, I believe one of them, I think it is the Cleveland Indians are undergoing their own uh, team 
game review at this point, whether or not they go through with it or how far along, I'm not sure. Um, but I do remember seeing that they've, they've initiated the review process of that. So we'll see if that takes any shape at all. Um, and I believe I also saw today that the Braves of the MLB uh, have removed a sculpture outside of their stadium, and it was a chop-on sculpture uh, with a, a visual of a, of a tomahawk. So that was one of those uh, you know gest- in-game gestures that are done, and I believe the Chiefs of the NFL do it as well. So maybe we'll see some of those practices, which can also be uh, stereotypical. We'll see those phased out as well. But uh, it's, uh, it's, it's good that, um, that people seem to be listening um, and in some areas, we're already seeing some movement on this. Um, so credit to the, the Eskimos or the Edmonton um, CFL franchise um, and as well the Atlanta Braves of the MLB for listening and, uh, and taking some of those initial steps. But, Mike, if they remove statues, how will they remember their team's history? It's part of history. I know. I know. <laughs> it goes both ways, I guess. But, yeah, it's... It's official. It has been removed from outside of the stadium, so uh, people will just have to remember through other means, but it won't be through uh, gathering and taking photos in front of a statue that has now been removed. Just read in history books, I guess. That's all you got That's now. Um, yeah, so that, that'll that about do it for Cabin Sports Radio today. The one thing I did find a little bit funny about the uh, the Edmonton CFL franchise name change is that the I think the final kind of nail in the coffin, so to speak, was that one of their major sponsors, which was a sports gambling website, had said they will either pull their sponsorship or the team will drop the Ed Eskimos nickname I thought and then it, the news came out shortly after that that Edmonton was going to be dropping the name and I thought oh what are the odds that you go mm. on this website right now they've got odds for new names up already <laughs> may oh, as well yes, capitalize yes. on that right why waste time uh, money talks Lecter <laughs> money talks indeed all right have yourselves a wonderful week we will try to do the same here on Cabin Sports Radio, and uh, we'll talk to you next week.